Catalina. <laughs> uh, we're back, uh, and I'm here with two of my favorite people. That's Gary, Binary Gary on the internet, and Allison, Allison Plus on the internet. I am Chris, or Jazz Sequence on the internet, and this is a show about things that we talk about, and we don't know before we talk about them what we're talking about. And we try to make ourselves sound intelligent and usually fail. Sounds a lot like my day job. That yeah yeah that that I mean that's that's why this this show is the thing that we do. This is this is fun though. My day job is fun too. I didn't mean it that way. This is fun. <laughs> I'm excited we're back. I can't even I can't contain myself. I'm throwing we're emoji everywhere. Getting, we're also getting into the territory where the things that I bring to the table I'm not fully sure that I actually know. <laughs> like I've read about them, but even though I'm like I don't know if I'm really fully understanding what's happening <laughs> yeah that's all right that's fair yeah, yeah. welcome to the club i know <laughs> yeah. we'll learn together Why is my camera low today maybe my camera's I, low I, well this is a podcast so i don't know how oh. much uh, your camera matters you know that much a, we, well, a, we don't get a huge uh, amount of youtube viewers not even i watch it on youtube um well okay then i'll put the camera back down i guess <laughs> You want people to think you're taller. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I went to Long Beach. Woo! California. And then Monterey for a day. That's where I was. Oh, uh, I, I gave oh, a presentation a inside line. a pyramid. So that was cool. I feel Do like you... that's a bucket list situation. Yeah. <laughs> that you didn't you know you like had. that helped? Uh, yes. The pyramid okay. absolutely helped. <laughs> Because all the knowledge flows upward into the point. Uh, exactly. Or alternately, it disperses down and spreads among all the people. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah, I had it backwards. <laughs> there was a Mythbusters where they did something with pyramids and uh, levitation. Um, yep. Yep. We were definitely and it didn't had work. Did you levitate by chance? Uh, the levitation was happening. I was not one of the people levitating. Man, that was quite the word camp. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I had a conversation with, uh, with these guys, uh, which is soundcheck.ai, which is a, uh, they, there's a speakable, um, speakable element that you can add to uh, content in your web page. And if your, con if your web page has uh, this, a speakable element in it, then it can be accessed uh, or queried against by like Alexa and Siri and like voice assistants. Um, and uh, that's the thing that they do. And they have a, they have a plugin that does it. And it's pretty Are you... And hardly anybody is using it. Like there's only, it's like CNN and Fox News and a couple other like large media companies and, and that's it pretty much. Are you, um, are you a big um, voice assistant user? No, no. In fact, so... I unplugged my Google Home a while ago. Yeah, it's, yeah. I ask. Um, there's in the southeast uh, running word camps. There is a group called uh, something. My voice. I don't know. But I can definitely see the Some like, idea. where where a news agency, if they weren't already, would want to have would want to have their content speakable. Because if you say, "Hey Alexa, tell me what's going on in Turkey," and the only results you're getting are from CNN and Fox News, and that's it. <laughs> then you're that's a missed opportunity to have people like under like get name recogni recognition and uh or go to your website or, or whatever um and there is some amount of i mean there's no universal standard in the technology because it's all really green fields right now but um so there's no necess it's not necessarily going to tie you back to uh the the actual source um, but i guess google home if you have a google home and an android um, then you ask for the question, you ask the question, it'll give you a response, and then it will pull up the article on your uh, Android phone um, hmm. so that you do have some like 
direct what link. uh a couple years ago, there was a, maybe not a couple years ago, it wasn't that long ago, there was a, I saw, I read quite a few articles of people fiddling with Alexa and um, uh, NWP plugins specifically and working with the Alexa endpoint. Um, and it seemed like it was, like all Amazon web point, endpoints, it was pretty robust and therefore confusing. But mm -hmm. I just, I don't know. I'm not convinced this voice assist thing is going to, be anything i'm wrong already obviously yeah but yeah for me it's not going to be anything <laughs> no uh, for me it's not either but i i, feel I use like... siri when i'm driving like hey siri give me directions to well usually it's home from somewhere i am and i want to get there with least amount of traffic and that's why i ask it because traffic looks heavy and it'll be like take this route and i'll go all right but when i have a self-driving car like i'm not gonna ask siri to do that. i'm just gonna get in the car and do something else but i think that i think that the people that interact with technology today are not necessarily the audience for the people who would make extensive use of voice assisted technology i think that those are the people that would interact that are going to interact with technology tomorrow you know what i mean yeah like, you're right i mean the future is tomorrow that's fair like it's not it's not what's happening now. So like we because because we have been interacting with technology for so long that Siri, Alexa, uh, Google feels like an extra thing and weird privacy things and like it doesn't fit into our our day to day. Like that's because that's where we're coming from. Whereas I think people who have grown up with this sort of technology being there not using your hands is going to be an obvious solution. Like, of course, I don't want to use my hands. What do you think I want to type? Like, like uh, case in point, that Star Trek where they went back in time, the Star Trek movie, where they went back in time and the act it was actually filmed at Monterey. So tie into my trip uh, where, uh, you know, you've got Scotty, you got Scotty at the, uh, the, I don't know, uh, the plant that builds like plexiglass. And he yeah. goes to the computer and he picks up the mouse. I don't even have a mouse. I'm looking at my desk looking for the mouse so I can do Scotty. I don't even have do a you, mouse on my desk. Do you want so this one? Computer. <laughs> Hello, computer. Because he doesn't understand the computer doesn't speak English. You have to type. And then he's oh, I've used the keyboard. Like he can't fathom not having a, a speaking interaction with a computer. Right. Like obviously it's the future. Star Trek predicted it in like 1990 something. Maybe 1980-something. Yeah. So this is a show where we talk about things. <laughs> Mostly and often Star Trek. Star Trek and the Jetsons. <laughs> well, I mean, wow. those are the two models for the future that we need to base reality on. So, of course, we're talking well, about Star Trek and the do. Jetsons. Can we go with Star Trek? <laughs> oh, Star Trek. So good. The Jetsons seems a little, I don't know, like the 50s in the future, right? That is probably the like actual definition <laughs> of the Jetsons. The Jetsons. <laughs> that that's the elevator pitch right there. It's like the yeah. '50s in the future. Like it's more, but like what what's the family model in the future? The Star Trek doesn't really like focus too much on that. It's more just like, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, maybe Star Trek is post family. They have that like sweet daycare that you just kind of like all the kids go to. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty rad. Yeah. Uh, I've been reading in depth about a fictional city uh, called Nibine in this uh, D&D world that I am uh, running a campaign in. And in Nibine, uh, the family model is generally polygamous. So, uh, so that's the thing. And businesses are, are like family run and you sort of get more wives or husbands um, because uh, um, you need more hands essentially or mm -hmm. you need to pay off a debt or something and then the business have a debt paid off hmm? and the businesses expand yeah yeah because it because it's it's everybody in the family is basically responsible for the small business and they and very rarely do you have you employ workers you just employ your kids and your kids sort of grow up in the business it's interesting mm -hmm. um yeah it's also it's also polygamy goes both ways it's not 
not that you would not that you'd necessarily have multiple husbands and multiple wives but there's usually a, like a master of the house and the master of the house can be male or female and then that master of the house can have multiple of partners of opposite gender like it's not just like male dominated patriarchal um polygamy I was gonna say old school polygamy, but then I was just like, kind of, <laughs> kind of. I mean, I mean, where I am, <laughs> that would be accurate. But maybe I mean, I old think polygamy, polygamy. I think is such a great dates phrase. Back longer than that, possibly. I would listen to uh, a folk band called Old School Polygamy. Old School Polygamy. Uh, I can guarantee I, that that folk band would be based out of Utah. I would. Um, Considering I mean, it could also be a punk band, it, it could go either way. Yeah, folk or considering punk. well, folk punk, punk it folk. Could, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Uh, yeah, considering we have a songs. we have a local brewer that that makes polygamy porter. Um, oh. Yeah, but it's like two percent because Utah, right? Uh, no, I mean yes, it was three point two, but now it's gonna be four because we upped our our alcohol con by by volume content to four oh. because large uh breweries but they might actually i mean we they sell it out of state and a lot of they sell a lot of things out of state and they might actually make a, a non-utah version i don't know maybe not the utah free <laughs> polygamy porter what, <laughs> it's what actually, is going it's actually, on <laughs> it's actually been banned in states that aren't utah it was banned in like tennessee because they they thought that it was like uh advocating for polygamy and like no dude it's a joke <laughs> I I feel like craft brewers in general uh, uh, just have such a great sense of humor in naming their product um, <laughs> and love when I hear stories of that like their beer was banned because of the name oh okay well, the it's name and the label like, the name and yeah. the label because to, to be clear the label people. also like has a dude and two wives and like they're drinking beer or something <laughs> I was semi -closed. Family gathering. Ron and I were young early in our marriage we were at a family gathering and this old older great aunt of mine showed up with a bottle of menage a trois wine mm -hmm. and i couldn't stop giggling <laughs> <laughs> I, especially I as it was like more, i see that wine yeah and i and i just wonder like why is the wine industry like is it because this wine is fancier and yeah like threesomes are okay in wine but not in beer is that the deal <laughs> More accepted among wine drinkers. There are certain societal drinkers. rules in play here that who are we to question? Well, I think I think generally. I wine, just wish I knew what they were. I, I, I think care. That, I, just I think I that wines were. play with their names far less because it is sort of a higher echelon, like higher brow, like audience or perceived audience or like perceived like level of status. Whereas beer yeah, is like the, the beer's beer's normal power, Joe's right? like alcohol. Yeah, um, beer, beer is blue collar, and it and yeah. it always has been, right? Yeah, it's yeah, I it's fine. I don't. But I would like to see more things that are like kind of poking fun at the at the at the genre in in establishment. Wine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like there's so there's a there's a wine that we get a lot that we like a lot called Goats Do Rome. Yes, which this is, is another which is a one. play on a play on Goats Do Rome, which is a type of right. French wine. So it's but but like at the at the particular vineyard i believe they're named because they have goats that roam around the vineyard <laughs> so it's called goats do roam because it's like coats do roam but not yes it's brilliant it's so good i that's exactly what i thought of when i was thinking of parody wine names yeah. not parody but but wine names that are poking fun at yeah um i um Often when we are celebrating something, I will go get a bottle of wine. And I, um, I readily admit that I put way too much of my decision into the name on the bottle mm -hmm. as to like versus anything else. Um, and I always try and figure out like a theme to come home because it sometimes it makes Rhonda laugh. More often mm -hmm. makes me laugh. Sometimes she just puts up with it. And that's fair. Um, so but have on occasion, I hit one that's a home so, you, so you've never brought the menage a trois uh, bottle home? <laughs> like, hey, honey, conk. <laughs> <laughs> I have not. Celebrate. I have not. <laughs> and she just actually. gives you a, seriously, Gary. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a good one, but I can't right now because I drank the wine, and that interferes with memory or something. I don't know. Um, I'll think of one in the middle of the show. I like What's the idea of more anti-establishment 
once. <laughs> 19 Crimes is pretty good at that. I mean, not that 19 Crimes is, is specifically anti-establishment in itself, but um, like their design and, and they, they, so 19 Crimes is an Australian wine and on the cork, they list the 19 crimes that people were sent mm -hmm. to Australia for committing. Oh. Um, and, um, and so they have a couple of different things and, and they're kind of, they're all like prison colony themed. Um, so they have like the basic I, 19 crimes and then they have the banished and then they have the warden and then they have something else. I feel like the, um, the fact that it's an Australian wine like automatically makes it a little bit more likely to be tongue in cheek, you know? Just because there's Australians a, there's a good, are that way. It's just a good sense of humor. Yeah. Australians have a generally, I'll stereotype the entire yeah. continent. Yeah. Why not? Go for it. Well, it goes hand in hand with my stereotype of they're yes. getting ready. They could be killed at any moment by something poisonous. So they have to have a good sense of humor. But they're really good clients, apparently. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> these are all these these are all positives, right? <laughs> oh, am I supposed to bring the topic to the table? I mean, I think that we could. We could also just not. I've already forgotten when I was like, what did I write down? Um, the topic for today is Latham Loop. Latham Loop. I was expecting you to pull up an envelope and be like, ah, yes. That would be amazing. <laughs> One week I should have somebody else come up with something and so even I won't know what it is. <laughs> that would be horrifying. <laughs> no one will oh, know and we won't have the yeah. answer. <laughs> Latham Loop uh, is a sewing technique, I believe, um, that gives you nice... Um, uh, 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 doily, not doilies, it's uh, an edging sewing technique. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm pronouncing it Latham. It could be Latham. I don't uh, know. Oh, I'm, Latham loop. Also, a sewing totally technique. Totally different. <laughs> Well, I mean, that, that's sure that that could be a thing, but I believe that that loop is, is based on sort of the original when like uh, spelling where it was like L-O like U-P-E uh, or something where it was actually sort oh. of meant like a lens. So a Latham loop is actually a, a, a type of lens that is specifically used for killing bugs. Um, can we, wow, <laughs> wow, I was not expecting that. That's a real neat can, <laughs> Um, Hun, get the last of them. It's, it's much slower. We're going to be here for like about 15 spray. minutes. Hold on. <laughs> can we get I'll get the fly. Spray? Don't worry about it. <laughs> How is it spelled? L-A-T-H-A-M. Uh, <laughs> And loop L O O P. It's two words. It is two words. Ah, there. Yes. yes. It's not, it's it not a, like uh, it's not like a loop de loop. It's a no, it's not like a laughem loop. Laughem loop. It's an ice skating <laughs> maneuver. A skating maneuver. Ice skating. Yeah. Doing oh. a loop. Is well, there's skating? like the toe loop and stuff. So there's okay. a laughem loop where you use your laughem to. <laughs> <laughs> your Latham? Please, yes. Tell me. The Latham uh, a part of the costume? A, a, what your Latham is? Well, you know where the arch of the foot is? Uh -huh. Latham is the opposite side. The opposite side of your arch. Okay. <laughs> sure. The bottom, the bottom so, side. So, of the so what you're saying is like the top. <laughs> no, no, no. Opposite the other, uh, like the, the outside of your. But like if this part's the arch. The bottom yeah. of the foot is what you're saying. Right. I was trying to think about how I could get my foot up here near the camera, but using your hand makes a lot more sense than me trying to figure out how to contort myself to get my foot up here. Yeah. I should have held off. I feel like that. Oh, well. It's going like tumbles over. <laughs> how did he, how did he sprain his arm? Well. <laughs> well, he was demonstrating oh. the Latham loop. Some pretty intense podcasting. <laughs> but the, the Latham loop was a 10 out of 10. <laughs> He stuck the landing. <laughs> stuck the landing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, it's realistically, <clears throat> it's probably like a sciency thing, right? A lot of things we haven't learned about are sciency, correct? I love, I love that you're approaching this from a realistic standpoint, as if 
<laughs> that has ever helped the situation. I mean, I, I feel like I feel like going with a knitting technique is probably closest to the mark. But sure, we can go down the root road of of yeah, it's sciency. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, maybe I don't want to do that then. Fine. Um. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> in programming, when you create, you know, there's flying V's. Mm -hmm. A flying V is actually a Latham loop. It's a programming technique. And, and for those of you that aren't programmers, a flying V in programming is when you have a conditional and then inside that conditional, conditional you nest another conditional and then nest another conditional and then another and another and another until when you, when you compress all of the code inside the conditionals besides just the conditionals and you just see the conditionals, it looks like a big sideways V, um, like a flying V guitar. Boy, even just talking about that makes my skin crawl. <laughs> I, I am, I'm so anti-nesting. I mean, if you're two levels deep, I'm wondering why is there not a guard clause in place? So, I, uh, I'm so that's, it's, it's, it's actually, it turns out I'm very opinionated on a code. It's actually, uh, it, the Latham loop is actually sort of a, a, uh, a it's hypothetical a exercise. It's a programming uh, exercise to demonstrate uh, how problematic the, that type of uh, code is. Laugh and loop. Invented <laughs> I am by. That nobody went programming before ice skating. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a little bit of an obvious uh, uh, hot take. Uh, it, was, it was invented by, by Peter J. Latham. Um, that is that <laughs> Peter Jackson Latham. I was going to say, what's the J short? <laughs> jQuery. <laughs> Peter Jackson Latham uh, invented the Latham loop uh, in a fit of rage uh, when he was doing a code review uh, back in 1952. Were there four each loops in 1952? Sure. I, don't, I, I have not written COBOL, so... <laughs> My my uh, my programming uh, history goes back to like original basic, and that's as far back as it goes. Yeah, I too have not written uh, COBOL. I feel I like I mean I don't even know if COBOL is what they wrote in, in 1952, but I feel like probably. It seems likely, doesn't it? Sure, it's one of those. I mean, in reality, what they actually wrote is probably something that we don't even like recognize the name of anymore, but like because COBOL is the thing that we all know is old, <laughs> that's immediately what we think is the thing. Oh yeah, 1952, everybody wrote COBOL. <clears throat> or they just wrote like directly in assembly. Yeah. There was a dude. 1001. Zero, zero, one. On the internet. 1101. One, one. In the early days of the internet that wrote it's like a weird fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a dude on the oh. internet. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Gibson, Gibson well Research. I think his name was Steve Gibson, and he wrote a lot of weird utilities. One of them was the thing that helped recover data from zip drives after the click of death happened. Um, but he wrote really, really low-level stuff like an assembly and then compiled it to executable. So there were these amazing programs that ran in like several, like a handful of kilobytes in instead of megabytes for what they accomplished. It was, it was bizarre. I don't know why I remember that. I just remember thinking at the time, like, it seems like an awful lot of work to write directly in assembly. I think it was assembly. It was. I don't know. It was, do you it remember is. GRC? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I just know that I learned that assembly was a class that I took in college and it sucked. Yeah. Well, I know assembly. <laughs> I could not so imagine writing I'm, anything assembly. Yeah, I was just thinking about it, uh, GRC and I don't know if you're familiar with that. They had another thing too. Um, Shields Up, I think it was, maybe. Remember that plugin? Or not plugin, application in the Windows days? Okay. It's a great name, though. I, I learned Motorola assembly, so my assembly is probably totally different than, than my assembly experience is pretty, pretty platform specific. Yeah. I, uh, I fortunately quit college before I had to learn assembly. So I didn't have to either. That was the fun thing. Was like I did it by choice. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did, remember, it, before, I did like, it before C++, so like that was weird. When my, my, uh, my school had, I don't know, computer science or computer information systems were the two degrees you could get in the computer science department. The information systems, like the difference was like if you had to take the operating systems course or the databases course. And I thought that 
the operating system score sounded really awesome. And the database mm-hmm. score sounded pretty like blah. And now in reality, I'm like, I, I mean, not that college wasn't reality. It kind of wasn't reality. Now in reality, I'm like, I don't have the desire to ever write an operating system and or work on writing an operating system. But like databases I use, you know, like constantly and. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was like, I view that, I view databases as like kind of your job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, like, hi, I'm Gary and I like atomic data and storing it in easy to find ways. And that definition is constantly changing. So like that's, yeah. The college you didn't know. I, there was a lot I didn't know in college. In college, I, I was convinced that, that what I was going to do was not going to be anything having to do with computers. Uh, I was, well, not directly. And like, I certainly wasn't going to be a developer or a web developer or anything. That was not what I was going to be. Certainly not. So I, I, my takeaway from college was that I was not smart enough to be a developer. So I think that's like, uh, pretty pretty average response to, to development in college. Yeah, so I mean, that sucks. I guess that's why I'm, I'm not anti-college. Yeah, I'm kind of anti-college. Uh, someone wants to go and they have a good reason, cool. But like, it ain't for me. I also I'm feel like- i finish a degree. I mean, I don't know. Like, I feel like it does not, it's not the right approach to, to learning software development. And there's a big gap between software development and computer science. Yeah, like, whatever. Um, so we're at that so time loop? to know to learn what a, the Latham loop is. Okay, so the Latham loop, it's used in film projection, and it basically isolates the film strip from vibrating and too much tension and prevents it from snapping. The loop. Um, the so Latham. basically, it allowed um, long movies. <laughs> I, I actually know what this is. Yeah. So yeah. It's so it's it's so there's uh yeah it's 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 so the film is not super taut when it's going through the projector. Um, it, it allows for some slack, so that uh, because um, projectors get super super hot and it can potentially melt the film, so um, so they need to have something to loosen it, um, so so that it it isn't super tense so that there's less of a possibility that when, when the projection is running that, the, that it's just gonna pull apart. And there's a really interesting story behind like the patent and Edison being a real jerk, classic Edison. <laughs> <laughs> classic Edison. <laughs> uh, but I was reading that I will post in our Slack. But yes. It's interesting. Oh, I think the, the backstory and, and Edison being a jerk was more interesting about how the patent was made um, and then lost and how they were, he was really trying to like put a stronghold on all these things in the loop, tried to prevent it basically. And, uh, really. When I worked um, at the Why do you keep company, waving a, what is that? A, a sour? It's a piece of wire. I've been, I've been fiddling. I have all sorts of like crap related to Raspberry Pi up here in my desk and I can't Your not desk play with it. <laughs> Yeah, I hear some extra fans, and oh, I'm missing a fan. There's there's one fan. Oh, here's a uh, five volt eight amp power supply. There's a bunch of crap on my desk at the moment. I'll clean it off later. I promise. I'd like to see I a photo. I feel like my desk is comparable, except I have like gems and tarot cards. So, and screwdrivers and a Kindle with an advertisement on the screen and a dead Raspberry Pi and yeah, it's I'll I'll drop a photo in later on. An embarrassing photo of my desk. Um, when I used to work downtown at the company that brought things in uh, and sold them on the internet, um, we expanded and expanded it. And one of the properties we bought was the old film distribution place. And so the building had like an office where people would come in and then down this hallway, there were these rooms that were, um, they were like bricked in completely except for a door that was made out of asbestos. Um, mm-hmm. And the shelves were where you could put the reels because this film was highly flammable. And then at the top was a chimney. So if any room caught on fire, they could vent that one and close off the others to preserve all the rest of the film. So they would only lose like, you know, 15 or 20% of the inventory at once in case of fire. So a super fascinating building, super cancerous causing built cancers, super cancer causing building with the asbestos in there. Um, we mostly used it to store like replacement pieces for larger products we sold and 
trying to stay out of there. Um, when we when we originally acquired the building, there was a tail section of an airplane in it, so it was it was weird, like a lot of things in that area of Jacksonville. <laughs> That's it's legitimately close. weird, though. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I remember cleaning it out like someone like yanked out this like tail section of an airplane like take it to the scrapper see how much cash we can get for it like, that was it that was the solution it's metal we can recycle it so we have some some we are. listener feedback oh um, feedback i don't like where this is going <laughs> oh no uh the first one i'm gonna read because it's an obvious uh it's obviously uh, spam, but I'm going to read it because that's what we do when when you email us. We will read your email on on the show and share it with with the rest of the podcasting listening podcast listening world. So this one comes from Joan, and she says, "Hi there, my name is Joan. I am an editor at Tips Bulletin. One word. Uh, while researching articles on ants, I noticed your link from this page, Grawlix, episode one zero one one one." To a get rid of ants resource, resource on why don't you try this? One word. <laughs> we recently published an extensive article covering eight easy ways to get rid of fire ants. It is a quick read and might be worth a link from your page. Here's the link. If you add a link to our post, please let me know. And we will share your article with our 1.7 Mio followers on our home, tip, home, home Tips World, one word, network yeah. Facebook page. HTTPS, Facebook.com slash home, home tips world. It's I look, eight tips on how to get rid of fire ants? Uh, eight easy ways to get rid of fire ants. Can you share that with me? <laughs> yes. Rolex is you. the answer. Clearly. I look forward to hearing from you. Joan Clark, editor, tipsbulletin.com, home tips world network. Okay. Well, Joan, I have read your, uh, your post, <laughs> your email on the air. Uh, we will not be posting a link to your article. Uh, I will be sharing it with Gary, though. Uh, and then he might share it on his own or not. Uh, but no, I there's have... very little chance I'll share it on my own. I've tried a lot of things, and I'm just curious if there's anything in that list that I haven't tried. Uh, and uh, I have uh, mentioned your Facebook page, so there you go. But you're not getting a link from us. Sorry. If you, if you have a spike in traffic, thank us. <laughs> It's not going to happen. But like a wind it, spike dripping through the heart. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Uh, speaking of Halloween, uh, Halloween's coming yes. up. Uh, so we have a Halloween-themed question from Allison. Yes. Uh, if Wait, we find it, was that the feedback? That was it? We're done with feedback? Uh, yeah, that was the only thing. That wasn't an Allison question. Oh, okay. I, was I mean, I can, give, I can give you feedback if you want more. <laughs> if the binary jazz trio were to dress up for Halloween, what other trio would you want them to dress up as? Oh, I like this. Um, Three's company. Be... Yeah, okay. Three's company. <laughs> Allison could be Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of Three's company. That would be a great idea. I, I was thinking of. I was thinking of like you know. There's not a lot of really good trios, and for some reason, for some reason, Three's company was the first thing that popped into my mind immediately following. There aren't very. There aren't very many good trios. <laughs> <laughs> which i don't know that that's necessarily contradicting uh that initial thought of not a lot of good trios <laughs> no i don't believe so i don't believe so mm. i don't know that i have a good one i mean there's the obvious it's like the three, of, there's the obvious like three amigos or three stooges yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought that was obvious. There's three in the title. It's like, yeah. I thought, I, I, thought thought that, I thought that Three's <laughs> Company worked well, though, because of the gender difference in, inherent in Three's Company. Um, and then that could be flipped for, for our trio. Right. Yeah. 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 Gender bending Three's Company. Yeah. I feel like. It's how we roll. Yeah. It just has to be it. <laughs> that works. All it's right. So next, next Halloween yeah. party that we all go to together. Well, now at least we've got it settled. We don't yeah. have to like, whew, right? You know, we avoided that meeting, thankfully. <laughs> so I'll All be uh, and energy is just taken care of now. I'll, I'll be I'll, I'll be Suzanne Summers. Yeah, clearly, <laughs> <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Get some balloons. Choice to wit. Some water balloons. It's hard because like the tri the other trios. I don't know. There's like. 
the three witches from Hocus Pocus. There's uh, the three musketeers. Three musketeers. Uh, you could go. You could go like less like like solidified. Like you could do like Harry Potter and Ron and and Ginny. Like, or you there could you do go. you could do um, uh, uh, from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, uh, Jack and uh, uh, Orlando Bloom and and uh, Kyra Knightley. My wardrobe that's, is that's a bit ambitious. Like I one think. step away from a pirate at any time. Like if I add a pirate hat or maybe just like one more scarf. Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at at binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the form on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.